Let's now discuss the gonads and the accessory ducts of the male reproductive system. The testes are the gonads of the male. They're paired organs that are the primary sex organ of the male reproductive system. Each testis has the shape of a flattened egg, roughly two inches long and an inch thick. The testes hang within the scrotum, a fleshy suspended pouch. Each testis is composed of the following. What we find are these highly coiled or tightly coiled tubes called seminiferous tubules, which is the site of sperm production or spermatozoa production, and contain the following. Sperm cells at various stages of meiosis. Large Sertoli cells, also called sustentacular cells, that play a role in spermatogenesis. These Sertoli cells produces important proteins, such as inhibin and androgen binding proteins. Now, androgen binding proteins is what testosterone, the most important of the androgens, will bind to. So, testosterone binds to androgen binding proteins and help concentrate the steroid hormone in the seminiferous tubules. In addition, the Sertoli cells promote spermatogenesis when stimulated by the follicle stimulating hormone produced by the anterior pituitary. These large Sertoli cells surround and envelope the sperm cells as they divide, providing nutrients and chemical stimuli that promote their development. So just to recap, if we look at the seminiferous tubules, once again, tightly coiled tubules. In fact, each tubule is approximately 31 inches in length. So if we uncoil it and look at what's going on inside, this is where we find spermatogenesis beginning at the periphery of the seminiferous tubules. So as the sperm cell divides, they move towards the center region of the seminiferous tubules. Please note, these spermatozoa are still functionally immature. Now, if I look closer into the seminiferous tubules, and here we have our spermatogonium undergoing mitosis to produce two identical cells. One of these cells remain behind as a future source of sperm cells. However, the other one, which is called the primary spermatocyte, will undergo meiosis I to produce two haploid secondary spermatocytes. And these secondary spermatocytes will undergo another round of meiosis, specifically meiosis II, to produce four spermatids. And these spermatids will eventually become spermatozoa. And we know that these spermatozoa, once again, structurally mature but functionally immature. And surrounding all these sperm cells, these dividing sperm cells, are the Sertoli cells. So the Sertoli cells completely envelopes these cells, providing the nutrients and as well as the stimuli needed to promote their development. In addition to the seminiferous tubules, what we find are these epididymis. Again, very tightly coiled. Therefore, they take up very little space in each testis. They're about 23 feet long, believe it or not. And the epididymis is the site of where the sperm becomes functionally mature. So they move from the seminiferous tubules eventually into the epididymis where they become functionally mature. But please note, these spermatozoa are still immobile. They're not swimmers, so to speak. So they're not yet capable of swimming towards the egg to fertilize that egg. In addition, the epididymis will protect and store the sperm. Not only is the epididymis the site of sperm maturation as far as becoming functional spermatozoa, their epididymis will also remove any damaged spermatozoa. They'll reabsorb it and eventually recycle parts of the damaged sperm cells. In between the seminiferous tubules, so here's one seminiferous tubules, we find these large interstitial cells, also called cells of Leydig, that produces androgens, testosterone being the most important of the androgen. So Sertoli cells produces androgen binding proteins and also inhibin 
while the interstitial cells produces again androgens and will focus on testosterone and testosterone binds to this androgen binding proteins which help concentrate testosterone within the seminiferous tubules which is needed for spermatogenesis and the accessory ducts consist of the following the epididymis which, which is found in the testis in addition to the seminiferous tubules then we have what's called the vas deferens right here and of course there are two vas deferens we have one ejaculatory duct and the urethra so this is the pathway in which the spermatozoa has to take in order to leave the penis and this occurs during ejaculation each ejaculation emits approximately 400 million sperm so let's look at the next slide Let's now discuss the accessory glands that produces seminal fluid. The seminal fluid will eventually mix with the spermatozoa in the ejaculatory duct and in the urethra just before ejaculation occurs. So let's begin with the seminal vesicles. There are two of them. It's a tubular gland that's about six inches in length. These are extremely active secretory glands with extensive foldings to increase the surface area. The fluid produced by the seminal vesicles contribute to about 60% of semen volume. The secretions are slightly alkaline or slightly basic, which helps to neutralize the acidity of the vagina. In addition, the fluid contains fructose, a monosaccharide, and some vitamin C, which provides an important food source for the spermatozoa. The fluid also contains prostaglandins, which can stimulate smooth muscle contractions along the male and female reproductive tract. Now, when the fluid mixes with the spermatozoa, this is the time the spermatozoa begin beating their flagella. In other words, they now become modal and are now able to swim along the female reproductive tract and may or may not encounter an egg. So, here is the spermatozoon and its flagellum so once it contacts the fluid produced by the seminal vesicles only then does the flagellum begin moving or begin beating and it moves in a whip like fashion the second important accessory gland is the prostate gland there's only one prostate gland a donut shaped gland about 1.6 inches in diameter that produces prostatic fluid that contributes to about 20 to 30 percent of semen volume. Now, as the man ages, the prostate gland can increase in size, which will make urination difficult and more frequent. So here's the prostate gland, so you can see how that if this thing increases in size, it will constrict the diameter of the urethra, making it again more difficult for the male to urinate. Furthermore, it pushes up against the bladder, therefore decreasing the holding volume of the urinary bladder, making urination more frequent. The third accessory gland is the bulbourethral gland, also known as the Cowper's glands. There are two of them. They're quite small. They're spherically shaped glands about 0.5 inches in diameter, so about the size of peas basically. They secrete a thick alkaline mucus that will help neutralize the acidity of the urine in the urethra and also will help lubricate the urethra and the gland's penis, the tip of the penis. The secretions of the bulbourethral glands is what makes seminal fluid very gel-like and gelatinous. So semen consists of spermatozoa, modal spermatozoa, and seminal fluid. So seminal fluid once again produced by the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and the bulbourethral glands. Furthermore, the peristaltic contractions will cause these glands to secrete their fluids into the ejaculatory duct and the urethra at the point just before ejaculation, which is called emission. So emission is the point just before the male ejaculates, before the semen is ejected from the penis. Let's look at the next slide. The male external genitalia consist of the penis and the scrotum. Beginning with the penis, it's a tubular organ that eliminates urine and introduces semen into the female's vagina during sexual intercourse. Erectile tissue of the penis consists of three cylindrically shaped columns, two 
corpora cavernosa, right here, these are the corpora cavernosa, and the corpus spongiosum, which is this structure right here. Now, within these erectile tissues, the corpora cavernosa and the corpus spongiosum consist of a three-dimensional matrix of vascular channels. So all of this are vascular channels in a three-dimensional maze. Right in the center of each of this corpora cavernosa is the central artery. So there's a central artery in each of these corpora cavernosa, while the urethra is found at the center of the corpus spongiosum. In a resting state, the penis is flaccid. Why? Because the arterial branches that feed into these vascular channels, again making up this three-dimensional matrix or maze, are constricted because the smooth muscles that surround the walls of these arterial branches are contracted. Therefore, very little blood flow flows into these erectile tissue. However, during sexual arousal, the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system will relax these smooth muscles, causing the arterial branches that feed into these vascular channels to dilate. Therefore, more blood flow increases into the penis and engorging these vascular channels, resulting in an erection. While the veins that take blood away from the penis, such as this right here, compresses because of the increasing pressure generated by the engorgement, which again causes the erection. Now, simultaneously, the internal urethral sphincter between the bladder and the urethra constricts tightly preventing any urine from entering the urethra. As sexual stimulation intensifies, the spermatozoa will enter the urethra from each vas deferens while the accessory glands will start secreting their fluids. Once the seminal fluid and the spermatozoa are in the urethra, rhythmic muscle contraction causes ejaculation. Now all of the movement of the spermatozoa as well as the secretions of these accessory glands are due to peristaltic contractions, wave-like rhythmic contractions. Following ejaculation and or loss of sexual arousal, the penis returns to its normal flaccid state, entering a period what's called the refractory period. So this is after ejaculation and or loss of sexual arousal, where stimulation does not bring about an erection. The length of the refractory period really depends upon one individual to the other, and it increases with age. Erectile dysfunction, better known as ED, which by the way is formally known as impotence, is the inability to achieve or to maintain an erection. This could be caused by poor blood flow to the penis, certain medications can cause ED, as well as some illnesses can cause erectile dysfunction. The scrotum is an outpouching of the abdominal wall. It is the supporting structure of the testes. It lies outside of the body and suspends the testes, allows the testes to be three degrees below normal body temperature, necessary for spermatogenesis and hormone production to occur. So basically, the scrotum helps regulate the temperature of the testes. It does this because there's the skeletal muscle called cremaster muscles that wrap around each testis. Now, when the temperature drops or during sexual arousal, the cremaster muscles will contract. Now, since they wrap around each testis, the contraction of the cremaster muscle will pull the testes closer to the body of the male. When the temperature rises or if it gets too warm, the cremaster muscles will relax. And by the relaxation of these muscles that wrap around each testes will cause the testes to descend or to move away from the body. Let's now look at hormonal regulations in male, which is the next slide.
Let's now consider the hormonal regulation in males. We know this part of the brain to be the hypothalamus and this to be the pituitary gland, consisting of the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe, or the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. So the hypothalamus releases releasing hormone as well as inhibiting hormone. However, we'll only consider GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone hormone that is released into the first capillary found around this stalk-like structure called the infundibulum. But we're keeping it simple, so we're just referring to this as the stalk. So GnRH is released into this first capillary bed, officially now in blood, making its way down to the anterior pituitary, where GnRH is then released into the anterior pituitary, where it stimulates these endocrine cells. So Basically, GnRH's target cells are the endocrine cells of the anterior pituitary. So GnRH will stimulate the anterior pituitary to release and secrete FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, which then enters this capillary bed for circulation. So let's consider FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone produced by the anterior pituitary, the target site being the testes, specifically the Sertoli cells found in the seminiferous tubules. So what does follicle-stimulating hormone do? Well, it stimulates the Sertoli cells to secrete and produce the following, inhibin. It also stimulates spermatogenesis. It also stimulates the Sertoli cells to produce androgen binding proteins, ABP. Let's now consider luteinizing hormone, which also is stimulated by GnRH produced by the hypothalamus. So the target site of LH, luteinizing hormone, once again is the testes, specifically the interstitial cells that we find in between the seminiferous tubules. So what does the interstitial cells produce in response to LH? Well, it's stimulated to produce testosterone the major or most important androgen. Now when certain levels of testosterone are reached through the negative feedback, it will inhibit the anterior pituitary and also inhibit the hypothalamus. So it inhibits the release of GnRH and inhibits the release of LH. Now inhibin does the same thing. Through the negative feedback, it inhibits the anterior pituitary as well as the hypothalamus. Now, what does testosterone do? Well, it stimulates bone and muscle growth in males. Since males have a higher level of testosterone, males in general are more muscular than females. Establishment and maintenance of male secondary sexual characteristics, such as axillary hair, facial hair, pubic hair, is due to the influence of testosterone. Also, the maintenance of accessory glands and organs. Now, testosterone is also needed for spermatogenesis. So what testosterone will do is it binds to ABP, androgen binding proteins produced by the Sertoli cells. So now that it binds to ABP, testosterone is now concentrated within the seminiferous tubules, which is needed for spermatogenesis. Let's look at the next slide.